Recently, the KX826 pyrolutamide 0.5% phase 3 clinical trial in China, conducted by Kintor Pharma, resulted in a significant setback as the drug demonstrated no statistical superiority over placebo in increasing hair count. This outcome was particularly unexpected given that the previous phase 2 trials in China for KX826 pyrolutamide had shown a statistically significant improvement in hair count with KX826 at both a 0.5% and a 0.2% concentrations, with 0.5% demonstrating greater efficacy over placebo. The failure in phase 3 contrasts sharply with these earlier results, necessitating a re-evaluation of KX826 formulation, dosage, or administration strategy. The issue might be attributed to the drug's high molecular weight, and also the challenges associated with skin absorption, suggesting that the higher concentration could potentially enhance its efficacy. But one thing must be noted, right? If we go with a higher concentration with KX826 pyrolutamide, we do run the risk of exposing the body to more of this very strong anti-androgen, right? It has a IC50 of 0.28 nanomolar, meaning it's very, very effective at small quantities at blocking the androgen receptor. So the lower the IC50 score is, the more effective that particular drug is at doing what it's supposed to do, right? If that makes sense. So KX826 both in phase one, phase two, and phase three came out with a pretty safe, not pretty safe, very safe profile. Essentially, nobody had any sort of systemic hormones messed with. And the most common complaint was agitation at the site of application, which is primarily due to the contact dermatitis from whatever carrier that they're using. So it could be the alcohol in their solution that they're doing in the clinical trials, or it could be the propylene glycol that they may have. It could be a variety of things. But increasing that concentration could potentially have side effects. But that's something that has to be experimented with. I had some hard asses in some of the Discord servers state to me like, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. They've already tested this in phase one. Look at this particular graph over here. This graph says that 3 milligram, 12 milligram, and 48 milligram, you're getting this much systemic exposure, and it could cause side effects. But you have to take into account the fact that at 3 milligram, 12 milligram, and 48 milligram, the researchers didn't notice any sort of suppression of androgenic activity in the body. So I don't know what these people are talking about who seem to have this sort of criticism of me. Perhaps you need a particular load or amount of the drug to trigger that sort of side effect. But we know that finasteride and dutasteride, specifically dutasteride at 2.5 milligram, has side effects, right? So the fact that something has side effects, even if it's in a small amount of people, doesn't necessarily negate it from getting clinical approval. I hope people can understand that point. So long as those side effects go away at some point during treatment, and they're not prolonged after treatment, and they don't cause any permanent disfiguration, then yes, that particular drug, KX826, at a higher concentration, if it doesn't have those sort of side effects or those sort of issues that I enumerated on, it can be on the market. So, so screw you to that particular person who just is so annoying. I know some people watching this may not know what I'm talking about, but I just have some people who like to rage on about the things that I say. Now, if we turn over to Clascoterone or CB0301, another topical anti-androgen developed for androgenetic alopecia, it showed promising results in phase two trials with notable improvements in total hair count across various concentrations. However, subsequent results revealed a decline in hair counts from six month mark to the 12 month mark. So that means this thing was having really good statistical improvement between month one to month six, right? When people were using, sorry, when researchers rather were using topical CB0301 or clascoterone to fight androgenetic alopecia, male pattern baldness. But for some reason, the hair counts began to decline. And this was unexpected in the latter half of the phase two clinical trial. This decline suggests a potential efficacy issue over the long term, which casts doubt on the sustained effectiveness of topical antiandrogens like CBO301, coscoterone, in treating hair loss. Both KX826 pyrolutamide 
and CB0301 Clascalderone's sudden failure in latter clinical phases highlights the complexities and challenges in developing effective topical treatments for androgenetic alopecia. Now, going into this next part, some have speculated about the possibility of testosterone being needed for hair growth, at least to some extent in males. Now, I'm talking about on the scalp, so don't talk about like the beard or anything like that. We're talking about the scalp. So I've entertained this possibility for a bit. A subscriber in my Discord server sent me an interesting study from 1965. So thank you, Daniel, for this study. It's pretty old, but it allows us to entertain the idea of testosterone being needed to grow hair, or at least contributes to its strength on the scalp. Again, we're talking about on the scalp here. So let's see if that's the case. 